Welcome to the Cutting Edge Health Preventing Cognitive Decline podcast. I'm Jane Rogers. Over the last 10 years, our guest today, Dr. David Hasse, has been pioneering a new approach to slow, halt, and even reverse cognitive decline. Main stage in this approach is therapeutic plasma exchange. It helps rid the body of the rusty proteins, the sticky molecules, and the signals of decay that cause our brain function to deteriorate. Dr. Hasse trained at Vanderbilt and Mayo, and his clinic is the Maxwell Clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, I would like to welcome you to the podcast today. Thank you so much for making the time. Hey, it's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you for doing your work of getting the word out on this really important subject. It is important, isn't it? <laughs> and it's your life's work as well. You graduated your a Vanderbilt trained, Mayo trained MD. You have your own clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. Tell us a little bit about your clinic, and then I want to dive deep into one of the modalities you are seeing real efficacy in, in helping to reverse dementia. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we're the Maxwell Clinic, and uh, we just celebrated our 20th year. So we've been around a long time. One of the big challenges of individuals that are trying to forge their way, clinicians are trying to forge their way forward with a more rational way of providing health care, so there's often not a structure in which to do that. So we're very pleased. We have nine clinicians here in our 12,000 square foot center. We're really the largest integrative center here in Nashville. We are, uh, we were voted best of Nashville for holistic uh, care. Uh, and uh, we just love loving on people in a way that gives them an opportunity to discover, enjoy, and enable their best brain function. And um, you know, the brain has always been centerpiece to me you know, in healthcare because from the brain uh, comes all of our joys and our laughter and our jests, but also all of our pain, sorrows, and griefs and symptoms. And um, we, if we don't strongly put the brain at the center of all healthcare, we, we are going to miss the mark. And sadly, when you walk in to a lot of doctors' offices, they are busy folks. They've got 15, 20 minutes with you. And it's very hard to take the measures in that kind of time that are really going to ensure that you have brain health for the rest of your life. It's really impossible. No, I shouldn't say it's impossible. I, I practice inside the insurance networks for 16 years. I did everything mm -hmm. possible to make advanced uh, functional integrative care available. And the problem is there's just the insurance companies squeeze you down so you don't have enough time to do the work that needs to be done. It's really mm -hmm. a, a time game. And, and that's a terrible issue because if, instead, if you think of health as an investment and, and recognize that, you can have a hugely decreased total cost of care for your medical and health adventures in life if you're proactive. And to be proactive means you need to understand the landscape for yourself. You need to understand the multifactorial causation of your challenges, and you need to be able to address that multifactorial challenges with multifactorial treatments. Mm -hmm. And that while that is that sounds complex, and it is, it's very doable. It's doable. And our bodies are designed to heal. That's one of my core beliefs, and I've gotten to see that happen again and again. People, my patients have surprised me again and again. <laughs> and um, uh, because our, we're just designed to heal. So our job is to figure out what is keeping that person from maintaining the level of health that they desire. Well put. So one of the things that you're doing in your clinic that just piqued my curiosity was therapeutic plasma exchange. That is new for these podcast listeners. At least we haven't, we haven't talked about it yet. A, could you define it? B, what are you seeing with this modality? So I think it's a huge travesty that people have not heard of this. I think it's, I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, but, but I, I'm amazed at how quiet this technology has been. 
And this remar remarkable study called the AMBAR study that came out in 2020 in the midst of COVID. And it showed that individuals that it was a multinational, multi-center, randomized, placebo-controlled trial that looked at the effect of advanced and mild Alzheimer's disease when treated with this plasma exchange. And it showed that individuals with even advanced Alzheimer's disease had a 60% decrease in their rate of progression over 14 months compared to placebo. 60, 60 that's, percent. That's huge. It's huge. But what's huge. even more interesting, what's even more interesting, it's, it's monstrous. It's, you know, three times better than the best drug that has been shown and with remarkably low side effects. But in mild Alzheimer's disease, those individuals actually had improvement 14 months compared to their baseline at starting. They didn't just do better than placebo. They actually had improvement from their baseline after 14 months. And in our experience, when we get to catch people in mild cognitive decline in, uh, or in the, these, those individuals who have a precursor to dementia, um, they even have a better result because, um, so anyway, it's a very, very exciting therapy. This is a standard medical treatment. This is not, this is something that's done in every major medical center, uh, but it's not made available for individuals with cognitive decline. And, um, and so I felt morally outraged by that. <laughs> I'd already been doing plasma exchange because I'm researching its utility in reversing aging. And because this is actually our most important and most likely successful therapy for reducing biological aging. And, and then when we're going like, oh, the data is very clear that it not only improves cognitive function or it, it has positive effects for cognitive functions, functional outcomes. It had the uh, spec scans done before and after comparing the placebo to the plasma exchange. And there was less brain death in the group mm -hmm. that got plasma exchange. <clears throat> and there was also markers of neurodegeneration, such as amyloid beta and phosphorylated tau. And those markers also went in a favorable direction. So when we're looking at a biological outcome, a metabolic outcome, a functional outcome, a cognitive outcome, all showing positivity, there was one of the primary measures that didn't meet statistical significance by a tiny, tiny smidge. And everything else did. And that was the reason that people have given to say, well, that wasn't, that didn't meet all of its primary endpoints. But uh, this is the largest study that's ever been done in the field of apheresis, which is plasma exchange. And um, it was blazingly successful by my standards. And how many uh, people were in the study? <clears throat> uh, There's nearly 500 enrolled. And so, I mean, this, this was done in the United States and Spain. This is multi academic institutions. Mm -hmm. um, it was an incredibly difficult study to do, incredibly expensive to pull off. And it's utilizing raw materials that are basically generic products. So some of the main treatments are albumin, which is a the major protein that is inside your bloodstream, is our re main replacement fluid. Now we've got a whole bunch of tricks that we have developed to improve our outcomes alongside of that. However, um, there's, it's going to be very, very difficult to get another fund study like this funded because there's not some blockbuster drug that is um, going to make some group of shareholders a lot of money. And so, um, but that's just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And, um, and when you're looking at a disease such as Alzheimer's disease, and the devastation that it causes, um, you know, you got to put the pedal to the metal on this. These things. There's, there's and not the epidemic. A, there's, there's proportions not a, that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. What's that? The epidemic proportions of it that we're going to be seeing in the coming decades. Oh yeah, and and interestingly enough, we also use therapeutic plasma exchange to treat long COVID, and so that has shown real promise as well. Um. And, and I'd, I'd love to go into some of the science behind this. I mean, how nerdy is your audience? Because I can get, I, we're I get, nerdy. 
Like we're, okay, we're nerdy. Well, you're nerdy. I just want to say, don't feel bad if I talk over you here, okay? Because, um, and sometimes it's impolite to go into too deep a science in some of these podcasts, but it's so magical. It's, it's, it's the magic of healing that gets me excited. So I got into studying this process uh, when one of my deep dive patients called, he's a Silicon Valley CEO or C-level employee. And, and I asked him when we first started working together, how would, what do you want to accomplish by working together? This was about seven years ago, eight years ago now. And he said, I want to live forever. And I was, oh. I was just shocked. I was like, I can't believe somebody said that. And then I went, well, okay, what would it be like if I assumed that was possible? What would be the therapies that actually would make the biggest difference to longevity? Mm -hmm. So I took a several months and dug deep into all of the technologies, gene editing, stem cell therapies, you know, small molecule therapies, uh, therapies focused on apoptosis and and I came upon the study of parabiosis. Have you ever heard the term parabiosis before? No. Enlighten me. Parabiosis. What is it? Now, this is a crazy study, crazy set of interesting studies that have been done at multiple universities. This is solid science, where they took a young mouse and an old mouse that are clones of each other, and they sewed them together. And over a course of, and then of those two little mice that are, you know, sewn together with a little flap of skin on the side, run around the cage together. And after about a week, an amazing thing starts to happen. That old mouse starts to turn young. Its, uh, its muscles regenerate faster, become resistant to injury. Its osteoporosis starts to reverse. Its cardiac function improves. It's T cell and B cell immune function start to revert that to a younger mouse. Uh, the uh, hair starts growing in more thick and full. And most remarkable is, and, and fatty liver reversed. And most remarkable is new neurogenesis started. New brain cells started sprouting in that old mouse's brain. Then you separate the two mice, the Young mouse is fine, lives to its normal expected lifespan. And the old mouse lives closer to the lifespan of the young mouse. <laughs> so really? Yeah. So now, and there's not been a lot of studies done on the age extension part of this. So there's some rat studies, some rabbit studies. So, um, but all of that, um, so anyway, when we were trying to think about this, well, this is amazing science. It, it taught us that our plasma, the liquid part of our blood, carries a lot of information to all of our cells. It doesn't just carry nutrients and carry away toxins. It carries information in the form of molecular signals. And these molecular signals constantly are telling our cells how to behave. And when they did this study, they found out that if you could remove the signals that built up in old. The I think old is toxic. It sends a toxic message. If you remove those old signals, and even if you just replace it with clean plasma like albumin, not the young plasma, then the cells in the body as a whole actually start behaving young. And that's an amazing recognition that it is our cellular habitat that determines the health of our cellular function. So a lot of people think that, well, <clears throat> there's nothing I can do about all the Alzheimer's and aging, et cetera. But we know that if you eat clean, you exercise, you breathe clean air, you drink clean water, you know, you're, if you have cleaner plasma, Mm -hmm. That makes for healthier cells. Well, what plasma exchange does, so when we take that study of parabiosis to the human, um, and we have now just completed one of the most extensive studies of plasma exchange and its effect on longevity that's ever been done in the world. And we have data sets that are absolutely incredible. And <clears throat> I'll be talking more about that when our data is released. But it's... Um, it's very positive. 
And the, but the modifications and how you do plasma exchange does matter. So what is plasma exchange? Okay. People are going like, well, you keep saying this. We, the, what we do, we call it actually hope, which is habitat optimizing plasma exchange. It means you okay. put a, a big IV in one arm and a big IV in the other arm and blood comes out one side. Uh, it goes into a machine and your red blood cells and your white blood cells and all those solid pieces of that's in the blood get separated from the liquid part of the blood, which we call plasma. And we throw out the old plasma and we replace it with a pharmaceutically clean albumin, which is a liquid that has the main protein that is in the plasma. And that's what the replacement fluid uh, that gets mixed back with your cells and that goes in the other IV back into the arm. That's the plasma exchange part. And then we have measured beforehand what are the other, what is everything we can do? What are the things we can add in to make this the safest um, environment possible for the cells? And how can we optimize the cellular habitat using plasma exchange and augmentation uh, products and fluids. So it's a highly individualized therapy, but you're essentially decluttering the blood. You're getting, you're getting an oil change for the bloodstream. And that goes on until we will remove anywhere up to about three and a half liters of plasma. So this is getting, um, we, we, we essentially remove the same amount of plasma that your body started with. So at the end of that, your plasma is very clean. Your blood is very clean. And the cells recognize that a clean environment is a young environment. And so all the genes that are associated with youth, I shouldn't say all the genes, but many, many genes in many different tissues believe that they are in a young body and they start acting young again, which turns on many of the factors for regeneration, for rejuvenation. And, and that is, so this is a true cellular therapy at the very foundation. And what's interesting is the AMBAR study has already proven this works for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I can talk all day long about all the fancy science, which I'm very interested in because this is a direct therapy for longevity. And I'm trying to find many of the, mar I want to know why it works so that we can keep making that therapy better. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it is, um, hetero, you know, habitat optimizing plasma exchange is, uh, an absolute game changer. It's very exciting because mm -hmm. if you think about preventing cognitive decline, if you can slow aging, cognitive decline is a disease of aging. So if you can slow that, if you can create a longevity focused protocol that's going to to reverse your biological age, you're not going to get heart disease, cancer, dementia at the same rate you would have without this intervention. You know, and that that is what we do believe is going to happen. I mean, for instance, we know, we know that we turn down the expression of oncogenes when we do plasma exchange. So one of the markers are some of the genes that turn on cancer, uh, calm down. And it's been fascinating. One of the, one of our patients with a blood cancer, uh, has been getting better mm -hmm. as we've been treating everything about his habitat and his habitat. When you treat the habitat, of course, that's what are you doing with your diet? What are you doing with your supplements? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. I'm not including all of that in this data. What I'm, the data I'm looking at is just a straight, um, habitat optimizing plasma exchange, but, but you have to, to get the most, most return on your investment of time, money, energy, and focus that it does require for doing this, then you should be looking at all of those other factors as well, making sure that you're not over polluting your plasma again, you know, and, and how are you bringing us the optimized nourishment in at that time? So if someone comes to Nashville for this, they stay a day, they stay a month. How many, how many sessions do you do with a person optimally? 
So, so at, at Maxwell Clinic, we actually have a, a cognitive health evaluation program. So, and, and it's a, some people are familiar with the Bredesen protocol. We've been doing this, you know, uh, longer than that. So, and, uh, and this, this is a much more extensive evaluation that <clears throat> takes a look at multiple different factors underneath, you know, what is, what are your perpetuating factors? I think, and I think it's very important for us to always customize therapy for an individual. Um, so that you get them again, you're getting the most benefit for the investment of your resources. Mm-hmm. And, and so, uh, in our, our belief is that multiple rapid plasma exchanges. So doing one plasma exchange a week for six weeks, sometimes 12 weeks is very important because we get a huge amount of response in that initial time especially if we can be aggressive with our optimizing factors. Now, those are um, many different things I can't discuss here, but there are, you know, how do we turn on the cellular programming in addition to cleaning out the dysfunctional signaling that's going on in the body? So, but we have people that travel here from all across the United States and so we also have a condensed method where people fly in, they'll do one plasma exchange on a Monday, day off on a Tuesday, another plasma exchange on a Wednesday, fly home, come back two weeks later, and then we do another one, two, come back two weeks later, do another one, two. And we believe we get almost the exact same effect from doing that. Um, but it was very clear in the AMBAR trial that the people who, when the most response happened is when we were doing plasma exchanges more frequently. Then mm-hmm. you're basically going to get to a point where you're changing cellular behavior, you're changing genetic expression, and then you slow up on your frequency. Then you maybe do it just once a month. And then as people continue to get better, we stretch it out to every two months. And, and, it's, and uh, we have one of our patients who came in with early Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, they were, you know, don't taking the, the business and putting it into somebody else was running the whole thing. He was angry, irritable, memory was a mess. Family was kind of in disarray. And, uh, and he was one that he, he said, doc, do everything you can. So, and, and that was what part of the genesis was of thinking, well, what are all the things that we could put to align this person to be well? And, uh, and so we did six sessions and he was already noting a very positive response in his mood and his memory. And then we said, well, let's continue that on for 12. At the end of 12, his wife came in and she said, you know, his memory is better now than I've known him in the last 12 years. He was, and he went back to completely running his company, uh, completely. And he has more joy and ease in his life than he says he's ever had. And, uh, and he continued, he continued to do once a month. And then, but that was over two and a half years ago, we started that process. So this is a persistent, it's a persistent problem, but it's also, so it requires a persistent solution, you know, and and that's one of the things that we, and man, yeah, are we all looking for the one and done therapy? Absolutely. Um, But this is what we have now. We've already finished one clinical trial and we have another three clinical trials going in different aspects of cognitive disease. We're testing new Alzheimer's diagnostics. Uh, we're doing more work in understanding the impact of plasma exchange on the transcriptome. We're so I, I'm dedicated to helping build the science around this. So we're we're a clinical and research center. Uh, so we we provide those therapies to people. Um, we don't. Ha- have a particular study to sign up for uh, plasma exchange right now in the <clears throat> like a, a, the a, a large scale plasma exchange program, but we're doing the research. We're, we set up and we're actually looking to be a site for I, I, this has to be studied. This has to be studied, and has, because we have to get more data to convince the conventional world that this should be the standard of care. Uh, I believe strongly this should be our standard of care of individuals with cognitive decline. And, um, but 
that's not going to happen until we can beat down the doors with more published data. And in, with that data, then maybe insurance companies will maybe at some point in Absolutely. the future Ab come through. Because listen, if you it's expensive. Oh, gosh, is and you think of memory care. What does a year living in memory care cost? Oh, my mother did it. It was twelve thousand uh, dollars a, mo a month. Luckily, right? she had long term. A twelve thousand a, month, a yeah. month. Luckily, she had insurance, right. and a it was month. still twelve thousand. So, is it, yeah. Yes. So, what? What? When we start looking at the cost of Alzheimer's disease, and we're going like, okay, mm -hmm. we have a twelve thousand dollar per month bill coming. Should this disease keep coming down the road? Um, how about we invest less than that to keep ourselves from going that direction? So, I mean, it's a really, it's a hard decision. Okay. And, and I think I take economic issues very seriously. We, you know, we can, we, we, the only way cost is going to come down for this is volumes, having more centers doing this, bringing down. But, but honestly, um, your mind is, uh, worth it. And if you can't, if you can do this, I think that it has huge hope, um, for, for changing this trajectory. It just really emotionally affects, it emotionally affects me because it's, um, and in, as, as we get clinicians coming here and we have, and we have more discussions with my, uh, more conventional colleagues and we go through the data, they go like, yeah, that data is really good. And, and when, especially when you realize the side effect profile, the way we do it here, we have probably one of the lowest side effect profiles of anywhere because, um, the certain practices that we have adopted. Um, anyway, that's, uh, I, I think it's important for us to take the biology of dementia seriously. You know, the people who are all still listening now have already overcome the biggest problem for dementia that exists. And that biggest problem is denial. Denial, I believe, is the most toxic substance that there is when dealing with cognitive decline. And if, if, you, if people are already listening to this, they, they're probably dealing with somebody that has denial. And, 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 bec and denial comes about, I believe, because we, up until now, I don't think it's been reasonable to think that we have as much hope that we can make a difference, right? You know, podcasts like yours and, you know, getting the word out that people should have hope. And that is a, and that there's, it's rational to have hope. Um, and, and, um, you know, and you're, uh, the other thing is that it's very important to protect the wisdom of elders. It's one of the things I think has been diminished in our world. And, um, uh, I know that I would not be the man I am today would not the love for my grandfather and him being mentally sharp enough to pass on his wisdom, uh, at an age when I was old enough to receive it. And he'd be very proud of you right now. Well, um, <laughs> he would be, my parents were like that too. They were in denial. They were trying to hide what was going on and. It's, it's very common. I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the financial component, mm -hmm. the therapeutic plasma mm -hmm. exchange at this point. So, yes, it's an investment in your health. It's an investment in your future. If you don't have your brain, you don't have a lot of future. So what kind of investment does it take? It really just depends upon how many are done. A lot of times people ask me, well, how many do I need to do? Well, the answer mm -hmm. so far is one is better than none. Um, some is better than one more is better than some. And because the, the changes that can happen, uh, with even just a few plasma exchanges can be meaningful. Um, the cost currently is $4,900 for a single plasma exchange to be done. And then depending upon what type of augmentation needs to be done, what other type of habitat optimizing factors go in that price can change as well. And, and that is, um, again, in the, in the, uh, hospital setting, the charges for this, uh, that 
our, one of our patients brought to us because they were looking for a less expensive way. Their insurance wasn't covering it for another reason, uh, was $13,000 for a single exchange. So, you know, and, um, continue to work to bring that price down. There's no question that it's an investment. So. Now I've heard a, a poor man's way of doing mm -hmm. this and your price. And I don't know if it's good or not, but that is to donate blood. And then right away, like go to an IV drip bar and have them drip a hydrating solution in. I've heard that. Now, tell I'm sure that's not right. But I just want to ask, is that the poor man's way to do this that would have so some listen, efficacy? Um, giving blood is a good idea. So number one, it's good for the world. It's good for humanity. Number two, mm -hmm. it's clear that giving blood um, has some positive health benefits. Okay. So I would never discourage somebody from doing that. Um, and I think there may be some benefit, but not to the extent. And, and then donating plasma is another way you could think of this. So instead of donating blood, donate plasma. But the amount of plasma that's removed during a um, plasma donation is about one seventh of what would be removed during a plasma exchange. So remember, I was talking about signals are what are being important. So the amount of if you have something that is set, you uh, just just came up with this analogy here. You have somebody in the room, and they say, um, they they say, Jane, 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 <laughs> Jane, Jane, to you seven times. Is that does that have more of a signal than somebody screaming at the top of their lungs, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> Both I know, are kind of. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but th the point is what we're looking for is a strong signal. We're trying to change mm. genetic expression. And, and we're actually looking at dosing levels because if we can make lower doses actually be beneficial, then that holds great promise. And so, um, again, looking at that, I would not have anybody that has cognitive decline wait for that data. <laughs> That's going to be a long time. And again, here's the problem. We need funding. Uh, we're seeking funding for doing these clinical studies so we can find um, therapies that are more accessible and be able to do that. But um, it is a challenge. Quickly, there are some other things I just want to talk about and see if you think they have some validity. Um, Young blood, we hear a lot about mm -hmm. young blood and how if you, just like mm -hmm. the mice, you know, that was a young mm -hmm. mouse and human beings are finding some success with using young mm -hmm. blood that has a whole lot of ethical problems. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, actually, um, I performed the very first total plasma exchange using young plasma uh, in a woman for Alzheimer's disease. And, um, that paper really? has yet to be published. That was, I did that about four years ago before COVID. And, um, and the problem is, and it's not young blood, it's young plasma. So as far as if you'd be doing okay. a treatment, there are a bunch of problems with it. And, and the, the challenging part is what do we, what are we unaware of that is in that plasma that has been donated? As far as ethical problems, you know, people are donating plasma all the time. I mean, you, do you, do you know that in the United States, uh, the export of blood products is over 2.5% of our GDP? Yes. Really? So already, you know, so you could actually think that some people may not want to talk about donating plasma as a therapeutic because there's already a very large industry that doesn't want to have some competition. That could be an idea, <laughs> but it could be, but, but there is a, there is substantial increased risk to putting somebody else's, somebody else's bodily fluid inside your body. So there are conditions called trolley and taco and there are, and, um, and you can have anaphylaxis pretty frequently in those type of situations when one immune system is hitting another immune system. And we have used plasma as a therapeutic, you know, for uh, getting close to a hundred years now. Um, so this is, it's not like there's anything new in this process, but 
we need data. We need data. Right now, we have data that a plasma exchange utilizing albumin, which is a clean pharmaceutical albumin, um, uh, that doesn't contain any other proteins. It doesn't contain um, spike proteins. It doesn't contain antibodies. It doesn't contain um, the other refuse that could come from other humans. It's been cleaned out, been sterilized. No viral particles, no prion particles, no other um, uh, other concerns in there. So I feel very, very comfortable about that. I think it's important for us always to first do least harm, first do least harm. Mm -hmm. And so to overdetermine safety is a very important part of our um, ethical obligation here. So how about if you're talking about cleaning the blood, how about an ozone mm -hmm. procedure? It's called mm -hmm. EBU and it, it takes your blood out and runs it through and gives you some ozone and under a UV light and it kills some mm -hmm. problems in the blood and then it, they put it back in the mm -hmm. other arm. Is, does that, so, so that is a is that way of, that is a way of delivering ozone and exposing the blood to UV therapy, but it does qualitatively nothing to filter the blood. So the filters that are used are filters that are used to treat a, a kind of a rare disorder, um, that is used to extract one particular protein from the blood that is overproduced in this rare disorder. And, and so, some people will look at those people undergo an EBU and they'll look at the, the container there and they say, Oh, there's a frothy, horrible stuff coming out. Well, that's what happens when you pull a protein out and expose it to a bunch of ozone. That's, 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 but it's not removing much from the blood at all. So it's a, that is a therapy to deliver ozone and deliver UV therapy. But when people say this is a blood filtration process, I think that's false advertising. I think that's going going too far in that direction. It can be very beneficial for entirely different reasons, but um, uh, it's and 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 I think that the um, you know blood filtration is another way that it continues to be explored in this particular therapy. Um, but in order to do blood filtration, you have to give heparin to the whole person. You have to hep, you have to give them a, uh, a dose that shuts off their coagulation system during the time they're having that therapy. And, and that could expose the person to increased risk for bleeding, um, you know, hemorrhagic strokes and those types of things. The type of plasma exchange that we do, um, is utilizing a centrifuge, uh, process. So the body, doesn't actually get anticoagulated during the procedure. So again, it's another measure of safety. Um, so that's a really good question. And that's a happens? really good question about the EBU because a lot of there is a false perception that that's filtering the blood mm -hmm. in a in a meaningful way. Um, I have yet to see data on that. And if someone has some blood issues like anemia. What's therapeutic plasma exchange going to do with anemia? You're pulling all the blood out and putting, are you going to get more anemic? Uh, you always have to ask, what is the nature of the anemia? If individuals are very old and frail, then then um, sometimes the red blood cells themselves are fragile and the old red blood cells will break down and diminish. But really, no, there is no substantial loss of red blood cells during one of these procedures. Um, <laughs> there, was, there was one person who had uh, blood drawn because we do blood draws before and after. And uh, when the blood draw after also includes some of the saline that's going in, uh, that then mm -hmm. it, it gave a false appearance that there was uh, a lowering of the red blood cell count. But then a, a quick recheck of that blood cell count showed that it was absolutely normal a week later, and you you can't recover your blood. I mean, there's a, I mean, there's it's kind of a, um, there is this does not cause increased anemia in individuals to any meaningful extent. Um, 
and, and also this procedure and this device is really the best at maintaining platelet volume. So how many platelets are present um, in, in the system? And because uh, as you're pulling out plasma, the next uh, cell or the next particle, the next size of plasma is platelets. It's the next lightest thing in the body. body. And so when you're pulling out plasma, you also want to preserve all the platelets. Um, and uh, this particular machine does a great job of that. I'm just curious. You've studied, you've gone a deep dive into what slows aging, what helps with longevity. What are you personally doing? What are you having your family members do? <laughs> That's a long list. <laughs> it's a long list. So um, <laughs> uh, plasma exchange is definitely one thing. I, I am a, I am a research mm -hmm. stud. I am a research subject. And uh, I, I, you know, this is the fundamentals, you know, how do you, uh, I think the, uh, the best way for me to answer that is not a list of taking these supplements and doing, taking these drugs, mm -hmm. these peptides, these exosomes, these, et cetera, you know, um, because I think that the healthcare really does need to be individualized, you know, not, you know, the idea that there's a one size that fits many protocol. Great. I'm totally open to that. But um, how do you best how do you best assign your limited resources of time, money, energy, effort, and focus to get the most benefit for you? I think that's always the question to answer. Um, and my list is too long to really go through. <laughs> <laughs> You're a guinea pig for yourself. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's, I, but it's tracking. It's, it's always, always, if you can get data, if you can get data, act mm -hmm. on the data and then re the get, get more data to see, did it work? Mm -hmm. Right. That's, mm -hmm. that's the only way that we're really going to be moving this needle forward. Speaking of data, you said your longevity study. And the data that came through with that, you haven't released it yet, but you're very excited about it. Can you share anything? Um, well, I can, I can share that the, that dose matters, dose matters. And I think when, when you're asking about, you know, can we do a, can we donate plasma? Can we donate blood? I think those have positive effect. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're starting that when you're 30, awesome. Great. Okay. Now that may have some additional benefit or, um, uh, we know that degenerative conditions are additive. The sooner you engage in your health recovery plan, the vastly more effect you're going to have and potentially the less investment you need to do with that. If you're already at a point where you're having symptoms, I believe any symptoms of cognitive decline is a late finding. That, that already means something is advanced because our brains are amazingly redundant. We have huge redundancy and backup systems on backup systems on backup systems in our brain. And so if we're already having dysfunction, that means that we have run through our backup systems, or at least our backup systems aren't working like they need to either. Mm -hmm. And and so we don't pay enough attention to subtle symptoms. And we think that we think, oh, that senior moment, um, that's an early finding. Not really. No, it's not. And so we need to be much more proactive with what we do. And I think that's, that's why at those earliest signs, get a cognitive health evaluation, you know, make certain your omega-3 fatty acid content is optimized. It's up above eight to 10%. You know, make certain that you are addressing the stressors in your life, that you're getting great sleep, that you're moving, that you're playing, that you're having, that you're engaging in relationships that you have multi-generational relationships, people older than you, people younger than you, that you are truly finding ways to contribute in the world. Because the most, I think the most dangerous thing 
is for us not to see a future for ourselves. And we actually spend quite a bit of time asking people about, well, what do you want your health for? And if you can get clear that this is what I want my health for, this is how I want to contribute in the world, I want to be a force of love in the life of a person who has not experienced that before. I want to bring wisdom and kindness into the world in a way that um, somebody else needs. I am going to tell you there is such a deficiency of loving kindness and care and um, just uh, mentoring in the world. So the need is so great for healthy elders. The need is so great. And, 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 and interestingly enough, that is one of the most important solutions for healthy aging is to, if you're, if you're get off of your ass and go give, go contribute, go serve. Um, and, and the, the multitudinous return on that investment is absolutely beyond imagination. And then you have a reason to live. I have a, I have one of my dear patients who supports a, a, like three different families. Um, and he looks out after the, the mom, the dad, the kids, and is being the uncle that they've never had. They've all three of these families have very dysfunctional family systems. They've never had uh, an older male that uh, was present in their lives. And, and he says, listen, these people need me. Let's get me healthy. Let's keep me healthy. They need me and they do need him. That's not made up. That is what life is about. And um, that's why I think we need to take this seriously. Our lives are so precious. I mean, the opportunity to get to be alive, uh, the opportunity to walk on this earth and to be aware of our own being, that's, that's unbelievable. And um, we want to make sure that we make the most out of these minutes. Dr. Hussey, thank you for giving us all these minutes of your time and those words of wisdom to close with. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. And sorry. And you have a great day. Take care. Bye. Yes. I said sorry about screaming, Jane. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to the Cutting Edge Health Preventing Cognitive Decline podcast. Any information shared here is for educational purposes only. Guest opinions are their own. This podcast is not responsible for the veracity of their statements. Do not use any of this information without first talking to your doctor. Cutting Edge Health, LLC, is not responsible for what may happen to you if you use their information in place of official advice from a medical professional. Thanks for listening. Be well.